start with, as you know, uh, <laughs> I told last week that, okay, Pastor Pitts will be back here this coming uh, week, but, uh, you know, unfortunately, he's sick with full-like symptoms. I just had this feeling that I'm supposed to prepare, even though I said this gonna be, last week was going to be like my last one. <laughs> I just had this feeling, but, uh, yeah, please do pray for Pastor Pitts, and I uh, had an amazing time of ministry uh, in Sierra Leone, and I think they're already talking about the uh, coming trip that's going to happen later this year. So uh, according to um, the email that I received, they've seen, you know, at least 5,000 people come to Christ over the period of time. And 25,000 people were ministered. Um, you know, those numbers I can't even fathom, you know, what that looks like actually in person. Um, so the Lord is definitely uh, uh, doing something here. Um, I mean, over there, Sierra Leone, and we'll just be a... We're just blessed to be a part of it, you know, to partner with, with the Lord through prayer and, and uh, whatnot. So, uh, yeah, with that, let me just uh, uh, open us up with prayer, and uh, we're going to just jump right in. Uh, so thank you, God, for, uh, <clears throat> for who you are. We just, we bless you, Jesus. Uh, it is our joy and privilege to come into your house and to, uh, to, uh, to share your word, and uh, God, uh, just to receive uh, what is in your heart, Lord. As the psalmist said from Psalm 119, open our eyes so that we may be able to see wonderful things in your law. So God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for revelation of who you are, Jesus. And uh, we recognize that as we read through the psalm, we see, the, we, we see Jesus everywhere. So we're just thankful for who you are, God, and the, the promise that you came to fulfill. Uh, so we, we thank you. We just uh, dedicate and devote this time unto you from the beginning to the end. Um, this is for your glory. And uh, God, we want this to be more than just an informational session or, you know, <laughs> uh, learning about history. But God, we want to just to love you more. We want to be in, so in love with your word, God. And uh, there's a desire that you have placed in our hearts to, to seek after with more and more of you, God. So we thank you. We just bless everyone uh, who have joined us here, whether in person or watching us through a live stream. Holy Spirit, would you encounter every person, Lord, as we share, as we go through the, the, the book of Psalms. Uh, uh, we, we thank you. We love you. Uh, in Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right. So we're going to start from Psalm 42. Um, as I shared last week, it's, you know, when you prepare for Bible study, you learn so much more. Because <laughs> you got to know your stuff, right, to, to teach. And I'm just uh, humbled and excited to, to share just as glimpses of what the Lord has been talking through the Psalms. Um, there should be two handouts here. Um, as, you may, as you may know that we just uh, finished the first part of the uh, book of Psalms, which is the uh, uh, Psalm of Genesis from uh, Psalm chapter 1 through 41, and we're going to start from chapter 42 uh, through 72. We're not going to cover, most likely not all of it, maybe like half of it. And if you have a handout, it says a companion to Exodus. All right. So this is part two. Thank you, Lord. Okay, I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is I'm, gonna, I'm not going to read every verse per se, and we're going to skim through some of the verses here, but I'm going to just focus and put some emphasis on the verses that perhaps that the Lord is highlighting for us, and the verses that you may have memorized and verses you're familiar with. So, hey, Lynn, good seeing you. All right, so Psalm 42, um, if you have a Bible like mine, by the way, once again, I'm using uh, ESV, uh, English Standard uh, Bible Version. So, uh, <clears throat> but whatever the version you have, that's the, uh, the, the best version for you, like I said. Um, my title, it says, uh, Why are you cast down, O my soul? And uh, verse 41, uh, chapter 42, verse 1, it starts, As a deer pants for its flowing uh, streams, so pants my soul for you, God. And uh, this is a very... Uh, familiar passage and verse for many of us. And um, it starts off, um, the psalmists give us an illustration using an animal, a deer per se, and to give us what it means to thirst and hunger after his presence. And you may wonder, what, you know, there's so many illustrations you may use, you know, why would there be an animal, especially a deer, right? So when I was looking at this passage, 
Um, one thing is that uh, God uses a lot of different illustrations for help us to connect on a deeper level. So in this area where the psalmists were, there was not a plentiful water, so you had to really search out for water. Right? It wasn't like you had to, you could turn on your faucet, water would just come flowing through the faucet, but you, you literally had to search out for water. So here's an example of you know, how, how the psalmist uses uh, uh, this deer to, to give us uh, an idea of, you know what, water was scarce over there, but there is a, uh, there's a uh, yearning desire that this animal had. It, it says in Joel chapter 120, Even the wild animals pant for you, the streams of water have dried up, and fire has devoured the pastures in the wilderness. And it's saying even wild animals are, are longing after your presence, God. And one thing, uh, any, anybody uh, hunt animals here? Any hunters in the house? Maybe not. One thing I, I, I was researching about deers is that they could actually smell uh, quite well. So they could s smell even like a scene of, of, a, of a person, of a human, about, about a, like a half a mile away. Right? So they're saying that they could actually, deers can actually smell water, where, where water is located. Not necessarily water because there's no order in water, but they could actually smell the surroundings, the plants and flowers and whatnot, to actually locate where water is. Okay, and uh, the word uses pants for water. How many have dogs here? Any uh, dog owners here? Pants for water, right? And you know when your dog is thirsty, right? <laughs> so it's panting for water. Okay, so I believe uh, the psalmist here gives us example as deer, as like like a dog. When something is panting, you know it is visible. You know that you need to give water, right? You need to supply your dog or animal with water. So here the psalmist. Uh, giving us example of a deer because it, it was visible and it was tangible and then exactly what it meant when deer was pant for water. Okay, so um, <clears throat> I believe that's a really similar to our desire for the Lord, right? You know, and um, I think this is area that God is, you know, including myself, He's really, uh, you know, just to increasing that the desire and passion for for His presence. Okay. And, um, you know, you may have gone through a season of just going hard. I remember just going through a season of just going hard. Like, so there was a season that I went through that if there's a revival service, if there's a uh, spiritual gathering or, you know, whatever it may be, I was, I was there. I was in the front seat of every event in the area because I was so hungry for the Lord. I was like, Lord, I've, I've tasted a little bit of who you are, but God, I want to move. I want to, I want more of you, Jesus. And um, I'm pretty sure you've all experienced that. When you taste like, just a little bit of God, you know, you know that there's so much more. And one thing about God is that God does not just leave you with satisfied with just one cup of water, but He's like, He just gives you so much more. You know, we may call it like the luge of His presence of, of, or His Holy Spirit. Um, so God is calling us to, to become like, like God chasers, is going after His presence, going after His Holy Spirit. I'm not talking about chasing after signs and wonders, miracles. That's not what I'm referring to here. But then God, wherever you are at, how David cried out, you know, one thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, to be in your presence, to be in your temple. Okay? So there's a deeper inner hunger and then thirst for God that cannot be quenched with any earthly objects. You know? Only God could satisfy. You heard this expression. There's a uh, God-shaped uh, you know, uh, or void and emptiness in, in your heart that only God can fill. You know? It's like that. So when you taste it, you desire more. Right? And it goes on, verse 5 and 11. So why so downcast Oh, my soul. So obviously, the psalmist was in a very difficult place. Once again, he's in trouble. Once again, he's, he's going through tribulations and hardships when he's surrounded by enemies, surrounded by oppositions. I feel like this is a repeated theme in, uh, in the life of psalmist, in the life of David, right? Okay. Why are you so downcast on my soul? There's, you, know, you could sense there's overwhelming emotions with sadness and sorrow. You know? It says, uh, 
And uh, it says right here, uh, why you cast down? The cast down literally means to bow down. Uh, it means uh, literally to prostrate, prostrate oneself in a public worship and then sink down under the weight of sorrow, under the weight of your sadness. So imagine you're literally like fall face down on the ground because you're, you're just bombarded. You're just heavily laden with sorrow, sadness. So that was the condition, that was the uh, situation of, of this psalmist when he was writing this uh, psalm here. So you see kind of background story of what kind of you know, things that the, uh, the psalmist was going through. And verse 7, it says this, uh, Deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls, at your breakers, um, and your waves have gone over me. You know, I, I sometimes go to uh, um, Great Falls uh, Park, um, you know, it's not too far from here. And then whenever I lean over, how many of you guys been to Great Falls Park? I enjoy going there. It gets a little crowded on weekends, but sometimes go like, you know, during afternoon or early evening. And I just like, kind of hang to the rail and just looking at the, the water just, just going. You know, there's a strong current and there's, you know, especially after rain, it gets stronger. You see just the water, just, just mighty water, you know, just going through right there. Um, I think just a, you know, it's just a small example of the Lord calling us to deep things of God, you know, because He's not obvious, He's not satisfied with just the one sip of water, but He's He's calling us to to just to dwell deep in the deep places of of who He is. Um, I think that's why you know when the scholars you know you know I've seen scholars who have studied word for fifty, sixty, whatever years, but a lot of them say, you know what? I'm just building, I'm building, I'm barely scratching the surface because there's so much more of God that you know. It's like it's like you've you've read the verse you know five, six, twenty, fifty times, but there's always the Lord God revealing something different, something more profound about the Word of God. So there's a deep desire, invitation that, that God is calling. You know? It says this in verse, by, by day the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. <clears throat> You could, set, you could tell that this, this psalm they spent a lot of time at night just praying, singing psalms, uh, just to worshiping the Lord. And, you know, I think uh, those are the times are, you know, are very difficult times, right? But then those are the times that when, when God draws us to the closest, knowing that He's so close to the brokenhearted. And once again, uh, the psalmist used the uh, uh, expression here, His steadfast love. Right. We, we talked about it last week. He has said his faithfulness, his, his, his love that is un unconditional, his love that sees no bound. You know, imagine you know, you're the psalmist just coming before his presence at nighttime. He's just covering us with this love. You know, covering us, overwhelming with this love. So that's the uh, uh, psalm right here. Why are you cast down, O oh, my soul? But it doesn't stop there. If you look at verse 11, it says, Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise Him, my salvation and my God. It doesn't say that God broke through. It doesn't say that you know, the weightiness and burden was lifted up from this soundness. But yet... I'm going to hope in God. I'm going, to, I'm going to wait upon you because you are my salvation. You are my hope. He's declaring you know, the name of Jesus. He's declaring that He is my Lord, my salvation. So you see this repeated theme over and over again. Man, I'm just struggling. I'm downcast. I'm sad. I'm sorrowful. I'm mourning. And yet, I'm going to raise up from my bed and I'm going to praise you, God. All right, Psalm 43. Um, we don't have the um, outline on my on, on our handout, but I want to just go through the Psalms here, um, so that we don't miss out on anything. Psalm 43. Um, if you have Bible like mine, it has a uh, subtitle: "Send out your light and your truth." 
And it's actually an extension of Psalm 42. It extends and spills over into Psalm 43, by the way. It says in verse 3, uh, Send out your light and your truth. Let, let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Send out your light and truth. It literally means that somebody is really spreading your light and truth. And um, imagine this, picture this with me. You know, I just, I, I, you know, as I was kind of meditating upon this uh, passage, it's like almost like you're walking this very dark road. You know, very foggy road, and you don't know what's going to happen. And there's, man, you know what? <laughs> okay, I, I could depend on His God, and God is just as as a God, you know, as 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 a person is walking. You know, God is just spreading His light and His truth. You know, and the Word of God says His His Word is lamp to our feet and light to our path. Right. So almost like this is, you know, there is no other way because everything else is dark. It's almost like, you know, he's, you know, stepping, taking one step here and God is spreading his light. Taking one other step here, he's spreading his light and his truth. The word of God says truth will set us free, right? So obviously, he, he, you know, the psalmist was not in a, in a best case scenario position, what now you may call it. He's not in like, he's like, you know, hey, let me just laugh because everything's going on. No, once again, he's going through a time of tribulation, time of hardships, asking God, where are you? Help me, God. When he says this right here, um, <clears throat> Verse 4, Then I will go to the altar of God, to God, my exceeding joy. Okay? And it looks like a lot of people say because of he could not actually get into the temple of God, which is a Mount uh, Zion, you know, which was a temple that was in Mount Zion. You know, probably he was excommunicated or withdrawn or, you know, uh, whatever happened so that he could not get to the altar of God. So he was just longing to be in his presence. God, help me. I, I, I long for you. I want to get to where you are. So you see that you can sense his anguish, you know, frustration and just longing to be with God right there. And he says this, <clears throat> my, to God, my exceeding joy. I was going to talk about this last time, but we didn't get to it. It's not talking about happiness here, because happiness depends on externals, right? Our circumstances and situations. But joy is something that arises from our heart, you know? Joy is, a, the, you know, joy, the, the, you know, that the joy of the Lord be our strength, you know, this is Nehemiah, right? Something is not circumstantial, something does not change, because it is a presence God in our lives. It says that His goodness will, and mercy will follow us all the days of our life. Huh? And you know the song, I got the joy, 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 joy in, down in my heart. Right? And, um, you know, people who are joyful, you know, may not be the most happiest person. You, don't, you may not see them smile and uh, giggle, excite, but then there's an inner strength that they rely on. Right? There's an inner peace and shalom because that's the joy of the Lord that God gives to us. Okay. And once again, the, um, verse 5, it's the same repeated theme here we just read earlier. You know, why are you downcast, my soul? And it goes again, hoping God for I shall again praise Him, my salvation and my God. Okay. So it's almost like he's going through like daily walk with the Lord. Just going through tribulation, going through hard times, but at the end of the night, in the morning, I'm gonna rise again because God, you are faithful. Yeah, it's good stuff here. Okay. All right, Psalm 44. Um, if you have Bible like mine, I've got a sub subtitle. It says, "Come to our help." Okay. Again, the psalm is going through a time of affliction and time of pain. But um, when you look at this uh, ch uh, chapter here, uh, the word you, you, you is used about 20 plus times, about 25 times that uh, this psalm is referring to you, 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 God, you, 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 right? You see that from verse 1 to, you know, just throughout these, uh, uh, you know, verses here. 
it, it, you know, it doesn't, it's not to sound, it's not to accuse God or it's not to dishonor or sound arrogant or like say, hey, you know, you God, you know, it's not because he's angry. <clears throat> but, you know, psalmist here is just referring to you did this in the past, how you were faithful to my parents, how you were faithful to my ancestors, how you, you know, showed record of your faithfulness over the years. Is it's calling forth you as in, in the character and personality of God, not necessarily in, in a tone of accusation here. So God, you are God who is, un, you know, who is faithful. You, God, is one who is unchanging, who is unchangeable. And whatever you say, God, you made it happen. To do it again, God, do it again, God, is almost, uh, you know, almost like petitioning you know, for the, for the sake of God's name here. So obviously, the guy was in trouble. He was in pain. He was in, you know, he was, he was suffering. And I'm going to just jump to uh, verse 23 here. <clears throat> verse 20 says, Awake! Hey, God, wake up, please! I need help. Are you sleeping? I mean, are you in slumber? I need help, God. Wake up, wake up. While you're sleeping, O oh Lord, rise yourself. Do not reject us forever. Awake, oh, God. In verse 24, he says, Why do you hide your face? Don't hide, God. Don't hide your face. Come. Show yourself. Shine your face upon us. Because there's so much affliction, there's so much opposition happening. Why have you abandoned us? It doesn't stop there. Verse 26, it says, Rise up, God. Come to our help. Redeem us for the sake of your steadfast love. You know, these are like personified you know, attributes and personal. It's almost like talking, God, wake up. God, don't hide your face. God, come quickly to help us. Very honest, raw, but then you could tell the relationship that the psalmist had, you know? The, the, the God that he knows, that he knows that God will arise himself and come to help. So you see the trustworthiness, and you see the relationship that this guy, this, this psalmist had with, you know, God of Jacob, God of Israel. And I believe, you know, the, the Lord calls us to pray like that too, right? When we feel like we're lonely, God, where are you? God, help me, God. Because God does not want us to hide our feelings and emotions, but He wants to just to approach Him as His you know, son and daughter. And that, that's when over and over again, you see God just embracing us. No, I have not hidden from you. I have not hid my face from you. No, I have not been sleeping. I've been with you for all this time, right? Because God is always with us. He will never leave us nor forsake us. Okay. Once again, it talks about your steadfast love. God, because your love, your, your long-suffering love, your, your you know, forgiving love, your bonding love, you, know, you, you name it. It's, it's, that, it's, that, it's, that, it's the name of God. It's the, it, that's His personality. So he's calling the name of God. God, for your name's sake, help me, Lord. Yeah. All right, Psalm 45. We're moving on here. Um, I have an extra uh, sheet of paper. Um, this is actually from the uh, uh, the Passion Translation. Um, and just to, you're gonna, you're gonna be able to just to read from a different angle, uh, from your translation, whether it's a King James Version or ESV. By the way, um, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, Brian Russell, uh, I'm sorry, um, Brian, Brian Simmons, who is the author or co-editor of the Passion is coming to Holwer Fellowship, uh, in May. So we're gonna give some announcement and, uh, he, you know, he came to spend some time with us last year, had a just amazing time, wonderful, time of the Lord and just to really opening our eyes and see man there's so much about the word of God that we have not really received that we have not known so yeah um, so yeah as I mentioned have you um, how, how many have uh, do you have the uh, the, uh, the version of uh, message the message version of Bible yeah if you do have message I want you to I want to encourage you to read the uh, book of Psalm through message 
because you get a whole different perspective. And, you know, some people say, you know what? It's like the water gun. You know, they, they water it down so much. You know, they like, skip this and that. It's not really inspired, you know, water thing. But then, you know, uh, setting those aside, you're able to get um, like a modernized uh, version of what psalmist, you know, could be saying right here in 2019 or 2000, you know, whatever maybe. So it gives you like a really practical perspective and just reality of, you know, what these words are. And it really kind of touches your heart too. So I encourage you, if you don't have it already, uh, just uh, grab a, a, a copy of the message by Eugene Peterson. Okay, Psalm 45 um, is a love song, by the way. It's very poetic and elegant writing style. Um, and um, if you have your um, sheet right here, I'm just going to just read and some of the things with us. Um, it's from Psalm 45. It starts, the title of the psalm is the wedding song, right? <laughs> Love it. Wedding song for the pure and shining one by the prophetic singers of Korah's clan. Um, and it goes on. Verse 1, My heart is on fire, bowling over with passion. Bubbling up within me are these beautiful lyrics as a lovely poem to be sung for the king like a river bursting its banks and overwhelming with words, spilling out into the sacred story. Um, this was a song written to Jesus you know, it's a prophetic uh, a psalm as well. It is it's a song and poem written to Jesus as a bride, um, bridegroom. If you have, if you have your notes here, uh, it's going to give some more description. Some may think that it's the wedding song of Solomon, but uh, it speaks about King Jesus as a bride of Christ. By the way, you know, you've um, read a book by Pastor Pitts of um, you know, wife of God. I think that's a wonderful uh, just composition, and just to uh, see how the Lord aligned everything in the, throughout the Scripture to to see Jesus as, as our bridegroom, as our as our uh, the one to to marry us when the marriage time comes. So this is a prophetic psalm talking about uh, our King Jesus as as our bride. Okay. Um, in verses 6, 7, which is, it says right here, Your throne of God is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of, of rightness. This is actually a direct quote. Um, it, it quotes on uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. I'm going to just read it for us real quick here. Um, Um, Hebrews uh, chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. But of the Son, he says, which is referring to Jesus Christ, your throne of God is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is a scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Is talking about, you know, obviously Jesus. And I'm going to just go through this real quick. Uh, verse 2 on the wedding song. I'm going to go, just go back to our, the uh, translation here of, from the Passion. Uh, beautiful, beautiful, verse 2. Beyond the sons of man, elegant grace pours out through every word you speak. Truly God has anointed you, His favorite one, for eternity. Now strap your lightning sword of judgment upon your side. O mighty warrior, so majestic, you're full of uh, uh, beauty and splendor as you go out to war. In your glory and grandeur, go forth in victory. Through your faithfulness and meekness, the cause of truth and justice will stand. All inspiring miracles are accomplished by your power, leaving everyone dazed and astonished. Your wounding leaves a man's heart defeated as they fall before you broken. Your glory, kingdom of God, endures forever, for you are enthroned to rule with a justice scepter in your hand. You're passionate for righteousness, and you hate lawlessness. This is why God, your God, crowns you with bliss above your fellow kings. He has anointed you more than any other with this oil of fervent joy, the very fragrant of heaven's gladness. Your royal robes release the scent of suffering, love for your bride, the order of 
The aromatic incense is upon you from the pure and shining place. Lovely music that makes you glad is played for your pleasure. And it goes on. He says, Her royal majesty in the back of our sheet here. The daughter of kings, women of honor, are maidens in your courts. And standing beside you, glistening in your pure and golden glory, is beautiful, bright to be. Now listen, daughter. Pay attention and forget about your past. Put behind you every attachment to the familiar, even those who once were close to you. For your royal bridegroom is lavished by your beautiful brightness. Bow in reverence before him, for he is your Lord. Wedding presents pour in from those of great wealth. The royal friends of the bridegroom shower you with gifts. And the prince's bride enters the palace. How glorious she appears within the holy chamber, robed with a wedding dress and buried with pure gold. Lovely and stunning, she leads the procession with all her bridesmaids as they come before you, her bridegroom king. What a, a, a grand, majestic entrance, a joyful, glad procession as they enter the palace gates. Your many sons will one day will be kings, just like their father. They'll sit on royal thrones all around the world. I'll make sure that the fame of your name is honored in every generation as the people praise you, giving you thanks forever and ever. Amen. It's an amazing, powerful uh, psalm. Um, um, just sharing about what the wedding day will look like. Uh, what the wedding day looks like. Okay. It's from Revelation. I'm going to read. If you actually, if you have Bibles with you, this is such an important, powerful uh, passage in the Bible. If you have your Word of God with you, um, turn with me to Revelation chapter 19, 7 to 9. Revelation 19, uh, verses 7 and 9. It says, Let us rejoice and exalt and give Him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. Amen. So you see, it's just the, um, the promise that God has given to us through the psalmist. The wedding that's to take place. The glorious, the, the day that we're yearning, that we're desiring, that we're, we're just to praying for. God, we cannot wait until the day that we're going to see Jesus face to face. We could spend many hours on this uh, uh, Psalm 45 here. There's a, such a poetic, um, there's a, a majestic, and yet there's a, you could just sense that powerful longing, desiring for us to be with Jesus and also the heart of our bridegroom yearning and desiring to be with us as well and um, that's, that's a wonderful day that we are <laughs> just saying God we want to be with you forever and ever alright so we're going to jump to uh, Psalm 46 um, I've got a soft heart that says, God is my fortress. And they're probably under the attack by the Assyrians. So under siege by uh, the powerful enemy that you know, came for many, many, many seasons. Okay? So imagine yourself, you're under attack by the enemy. Your, your city is surrounded by uh, the enemy. And it says, when you read the uh, verse, verses uh, 1 through 5, it, it starts off once, uh, verse 1, God is, my, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Okay? So you're just, uh, um, you're writing this psalm. Imagine this. You're just looking over the city or you're looking out from the city walls and you see the en enemy surround you. And they have all the seas, you know, like the, all the equipment and artillery or whatever, just surrounding you. And here the psalm is declaring, God, you are my refuge and my strength, a very present help in trouble. So that was the, uh, the, the, the backdrop of what was happening here. 
And therefore, will not fear through the, even the earth gives away. Though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam through the mountains, tremble at its dwelling. And it goes on, verse 4. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. So you see the confidence here in the heart of Psalmist. Even though the enemies have surrounded this city, I'm so confident, I'm so secure because, God, you are my refuge. You are my strength. You are my stronghold. In verse 4, it says, there is a river. It talks about Revelation 22, verses 2. Um, you don't have to turn, to turn there, but I'm going to just read it for us real quick. The angel showed me the river of the, of the water of life, bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also on each, either side of the river, the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each season, the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. So in the midst of circumstance, in the midst of seas, you know, the, the psalm is prophesying, declaring that there's a stream of God flowing right there in the midst of circumstances. In place of drought, in place of dryness, in place of, I'm pretty sure all the people around them are in, in fear, scared, of, oh my gosh, what's gonna happen? What's gonna happen? You know, not knowing, you know, what's gonna happen the next moment, next hour, right now. But he's a, he's talking about the, the stream of God, the river of God, that's gonna give life, that's gonna give hope, and that's gonna bring forth healing to the nations. Wow, it's a powerful imagery, powerful vision right here. So you can sense the perfect peace, calmness. And the Lord has given this, this word to not only to be, feel secure, but also help others. You know what, guys? You know, let's, let's look to God. God is our, our fortress. He is our refuge. He is a river of life. And then He's going to heal us. He's going to restore us. And then let me jump down to uh, verse 10. And this is a well-known verse that we memorize and we, you know, we place in our heart. It says, Be still and know that I'm God. Once again, you know, uh, the enemy is the powerful Syrians surrounded your, your place. And, and, the, the, and the Lord is speaking through Psalm, Be still, be still. Be still, still meaning you're casting down to let fall, to hang out, and to be relaxed, slacken in the hand. So literally means be still, meaning stop striving, stop worrying, stop shivering with fear, stop, you know, shaking or not. Just let go, let go of yourself for a moment. I mean, it's not, it's not easy to do, right? Hey, you see the enemies? You see how powerful they are? You see the oppositions and you see how little we have and how weak we are? And here God's saying, shh, be still. Trust me. And he says this, I'll be exalted among the nations. I'll be exalted in the earth that he is God. And then later, you know, the, the story tells that actually the, um, the, the, um, the people of Israel, they broke through the seas and that God did miraculous ways to uh, revert the situation. So they came victorious and God broke through. God broke through. And does it happen oftentimes when, when we start to praise God, when we start to declare the name of Jesus, breakthrough happen in our hearts. Oftentimes, that actually precedes you know, breakthroughs around us when we see the breakthroughs in our hearts. So here, you know, God is saying, you know, but I'll be exalted on the earth. I'll be exalted you know, by everyone. And that's what happened because the Assyrians, they were defeated and they, they, they fear God after this. Oh my goodness, there's God in Israel who is mighty, who is mighty in battle. And this is the one verse that's kind of been stuck with me for uh, many seasons, you know. Be still, because we all, uh, we all struggle with 
anxiety, worries. Oh man, how are we going to do this? And how are we going to figure out? Especially this in age, especially right here, um, you know, washing this area because there's so much going on. There's so many different pieces moving and there's so much of, you know, this and that. And I believe that's why Jesus, early morning he got up and he just went to the mountain and he spent time with his father. Just be stealing before his father in his presence. And I think we need that more now than ever before, right? Because there's all these things that are flooding our minds and wrestling in, in our minds and our hearts. He's saying, hey, I'm, I'm in control. Even though you may see the Assyrians, even though you may see the oppositions, whatnot, no, 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 I am in control. That, that these nations will, will exalt me, and then you'll see, you'll see it. Huh? So you see the confidence in his, in, in his heart right here. Okay. All right, Psalm 47, moving on. Verse 1, it starts, Clap your hands, all people. Shout to God in loud songs of joy. And it goes, For the Lord the Most High is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. Okay? So the, you see the uh, uh, expression here. There's a uh, excitement. There's a celebration happening. I think this will be a really good psalm to read over Sunday morning, 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock when people start to come into sanctuary. It's like, hey, let's, let's clap your hands, all people. Let's shout to God for, and with uh, loud songs of joy and just declaring who God is, declaring who Jesus is. Okay? And if you look at verse 5, he says, God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. There's actually this expression used for the day of ascent when Jesus was taken up in Acts 1, right? He was taken up from, from you know, and then all the people saw him, saw Jesus taking up into heaven, okay? And people will celebrate by seeing this, this uh, verse right here, you know, that God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with a shout of trumpet for many, many decades. So you, you see the, uh, the expression of people. It's like, let us shout, let us rejoice. And verse 9, the princes of the people Gather as a people of God of Abraham, for the shields of the earth belong to God. He is highly exalted. Once again, he's talking about, you know what, we're singing right here. We're, you know, our, you know, imagine your church on Sunday morning, you know, 10 a.m., 10 a.m., 11 a.m., we're all singing praises to God. But the one day that God will gather the princes of the nations, then we'll all exalt the name of the Lord. That's what he's saying here that He is highly exalted. Okay. All right, Psalm 48. Okay, my subtitle says, uh, Zion, the city of God. Okay. Um, the background story is a victory by Jehoshaphat. Uh, from the Assyrians. I think it's kind of related to uh, Psalm 46. Remember, they're under seas. You know? And then uh, the, the people of God, the, the broke through because God miraculously intervened in this circumstance here. By the way, Zion, you hear the word often, right? Uh, Zion uh, means uh, marked or distinctive. Okay? And you hear Mount Zion, the city of Zion. And in the Bible, the city of Zion was oftentimes, you know, it was interchangeable with Jerusalem or city of David. By the way, Jerusalem means, Jerusalem, in Hebrew, I'm not really good in Hebrew, but Jerusalem means a foundation of peace. Okay? So Shalom goes hand to hand with Jerusalem. Obviously, you could hear the word, you know, Shalom. At the end, right? A, a foundation of peace. Okay. So he's talking about the city of God, a city where where God presides or, or, or you know resides. The the place where in the presence of God is is tangible. It is real. It's a place where where people will be gathered together to worship Him. Okay. 
And uh, we could, you know, this is our church, this is our community that we could relate to in our, co- our context here. Okay? Um, as you know, the city, um, it, it provides protection, it provides refuge, it provides habitation, and also, city, it's not just about the walls and uh, bricks and buildings, but it also talks about what? People, right? Community. Okay. So right here, when the psalm is, is crying out, city of Zion, your city of God, it's not talking, it's not just talking about, of course, it, it first talks, of, you know, talks about God himself who reigns and who rules over the city of Zion, but also talks about the, the people, the community of people who reside. So we see the, the heart and this prayer uh, just the, of this psalmist going before the Lord saying, you know, God, you know, I'm not, it's not just me it's just standing here crying out, but it is all of us together collectively just singing songs for you, Jesus. Do you have a place like that? Do you, do you have a place called a city of God in your life? just want to ask you. you know, where you could come and, you know, when you find refuge, a place where you feel secure, when you feel belong. Yeah. Right? And I believe that was a place for the psalmist. Right? Once again, it's not, it wasn't just a building or a house or a temple or a sanctuary, but it was actually a community of people as well as they came to worship God together. Okay. All right, moving on, Psalm 49. Psalm 49 is very interesting uh, uh, psalm. Um, a lot of times, you know, as we have been uh, journeying through psalm, it's often praying and petitioning and singing and songs and hymns. But this is actually a, a, almost like a, uh, like a sermon type. The psalmist actually gave an audience a sermon, a message. Therefore, it starts like this. Hear this, all peoples, give ear all inhabit, in, inhabitants of the world, saying, listen up, guys, I've got a message for you. And all you are out there, listen up and open your ears because I'm about to say something important. Okay. And it goes on, uh, verse 5, Why should I fear in times of trouble when the iniquity of those who, who cheat me surround me? And it goes on, and obviously... They're in trouble as well, right? <laughs> they're in fear. And they're in places that, you know what? There's so much going on. And God, why is that the, the, the wicked people are doing so well? They're, they're prospering. They're doing well, whatnot. But what about the righteous people here? And also talks about how the wicked people will place their hope and trust in their wealth. Not recognizing how, how poor they are and how empty they are, and how it's so vain, and how it's so meaningless to trust you know, yourselves other than the Lord our God. So almost, you know, he just goes on just to uh, hitting different points here and, you know, almost like a message type saying, you know what, uh, in verse 15, but God will ransom my soul from the power of Sheol for he will see me. And he sees, the, once again, he sees the, uh, the, the, the rich, he sees the powerful, he sees the ones who are, who are doing so well at the same time, the ones who are righteous, the ones who are standing you know, and in in the fear of God are not doing as so well as much as the 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 ones out there. So he's just crying out for a heart of justice, heart of righteousness before God. So you see the anguish here. You see the frustration on his behalf. And yet he is desired to comfort his people, you know. That he is, you know, God will help us, God will ransom us, God will rescue us, that he is a God of justice, that he is God of righteousness. Okay. Uh, Psalm fifty, moving on. My Bible uh, subtitle it says, God Himself is judge. 
And it goes on, O mighty one, God the Lord speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to his setting out of Zion. He goes on and he ex explains and he almost becomes like a, uh, like a language that you use in a court setting. A lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, language of, of, you know, you know, law related language and is like almost pertaining to yourself as God, you know, sitting in his courtroom as God the judge and is petitioning. God, you are a righteous judge and God, you, you know, we're the ones who have been following and obeying your commands. God help us. God help us. And here in verse 8, uh, not, your, not for your sacrifices do I rebuke you. Your burnt offerings are continually before me. I will not accept a bull from your house or goat from your folds. And it goes on saying, you know what? You know, I, I want to obey you than to sacrifice these things, you know. Because God, you own everything. You are in charge of everything. You could, you are in charge of every bull. You're in charge of every goat. God, you can't do anything. But God, more than offering sacrifice, I want to obey and I want to do what is right before you. And so you see the, the heart and petition of the psalmist, uh, petitioning himself for God as judge here. Okay. Alright, moving on, verse, I mean, uh, chapter 51. And uh, this is a, uh, you know, this is a famous, uh, well-known psalm as well. Uh, create, creating me a clean heart of God. There's songs written about it, and you've, I'm pretty sure you've memorized it, and you've uh, read this many times. Um, if you're looking at your note, it says, uh, "Psalm of David, the Gospel of Forgiveness." Okay. It says this sounds like a reading from the New Testament. When you read it, it's very, uh, you know. Um, uh, what's the um, what's, what's the uh, word I'm? Looking? It's very real, and uh, you see the, the the redemptive story, redemptive plan of Jesus in through these verses here. And uh, the backdrop of this psalm is uh, right after David committed adultery uh, with Bathsheba, and not only that, this is when the prophet Nathan confronted David, um, and after um, you know you know the story that. Uh, King David, he, he murdered this, this, this husband to, to, so that he can have Bathsheba here. So, you know, he was trying to cover up one sin and it's covered more. And now the Lord God revealed, you know, through prophet Nathan. Uh, I'm going to just read for us from Second Samuel verses 12, 22. This is when Samuel confronts David. And in the story, he gives us a, a parable of a, of a poor man with a, 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 a lamb. And how a rich person had so many more lambs and thousands and hundreds of lambs, but he chose to take that only lamb that this poor man had. You know, gave exact image or example of what David had done, taking uh, Bathsheba away from Uriah, right? Okay. Um, I'm going to just turn to, just to give us a uh, backdrop of this story. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 22 and on. So, you know, um, in this story, Bathsheba, you know, the one that uh, he had committed adultery with, she was pregnant with a, a, a child. But Nathan, because of you sin, I'm going to take the life away from this child. So here, this is where, where David, just, he just, you know, he just lost it. God, I have sinned before you, and uh, there's... Anything that I'll do, I can do. God, would you forgive and would you spare the life of this boy? You know? He says, while the child is still alive, I'm reading from verse 22, I fasted and wept for I said, who knows whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live. But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? Shall I go to him? But he will not return to me. So this is after actually the, the child passed away. So you, you know the anguish, you see, you, you know, you see the guilt, you see how broken he was because of his sinfulness, because of his iniquity, because of what he had done. The Lord took away his, his son. 
you know, those, you know, you know, fathers and moms here, imagine what kind of anguish and how heartbroken that Dave, David would have going through at this time. You know, he would have done anything. He could have just laid down his life so that his, his child can be spared, right? So he's just repenting. He's just in anguish. He's like, God, almost like, you know, let, 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 you know, let just take me with him. Take me with him. Kind of like, kind of like attitude here. So here, verse 1, it says, Have mercy, have mercy, my God. And once again, he is pleading before God's uh, character. He is his attribute. According to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions, O Lord. And he goes and wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. And I'm washing. Oftentimes, he's, you know, he, he, David, uh, he, he uses uh, washing thoroughly and cleanse me from my sins. So washing is often related to ceremonial washing. You know, before you, know, you do anything kind of uh, off, make offering or do anything uh, ceremonial, you know, you, you'd always you'd wash your hand, right? How when, when, you know, in the day of Jesus, when you, before you eat, you got to, you know, First of all, before you, you know, as, as soon as you walk into somebody's house, you know, you have somebody to wash your feet and you're going to wash your hands, you know, before you're able to, uh, uh, you know, just join a fellowship or, or a meal. Um, so oftentimes the washing had to do with ceremony washing, but cleansing is, is referring to not only external washing, but cleansing of one's heart, cleansing of one's soul. So here, David is just crying before God, washed me not only ceremonial clean, you know, on the outside, and said, cleanse me with hyssop. Hyssop is oftentimes, it was, you know, a tool or something used to, to wash for the ones who are considered to be unclean, for, so that the person can come to uh, the presence of God, so that the, the person can come into a uh, context of community with others. So here David is saying, you know, cleanse me from, you know, outside in, inside out. Cleanse me everything. Because I don't want anything to do with this anymore. I'm sick and tired of it, Lord. Because just blot away my transgressions. In verse 1, I'm just going back to verse 1 here. So this is referring to who can blot our transgressions? I mean, this is not a hard question, right? Who can blot our transgressions? Only Jesus can, right? So this is a messianic psalm, as you can tell, pointing to Jesus. You know what? You know, we have been, for, you know, obviously God forgiven, right? God forgive him and restore the, the joy of salvation. And, um, you know, you see all the people for, for many, many, for hundreds and hundreds of years, they will sacrifice animals, either, either goat or sheep or, you know, according to their socioeconomic status, they could, whatever they could afford so that they, their sin can be forgiven. And we've been saying, and as we know, that it's, it's foretelling, foretelling and prophesying for coming of Jesus, who's going to be the fulfillment of all things, who's going to blot our transgressions, right? First John 1 John 1.70 says, but, uh, but if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, His Son, purifies us from all sin, and remember the story of John the Baptist, he says, Behold, behold, when Jesus was coming, you know, uh, you know, to, right, right next to, as he was, he was baptizing, when John the Baptist, baptizer was baptizing people, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, right? Okay. So once again, he's, he's alluding to, he's pointing to upcoming, he's, he's, he's our, our Savior who's going to blot away transgression. Who's going to make us clean? And I'm going to, I'm going to jump to verse 7 here. Purge me with hyssop. I just talked about it here. Which means you are ceremony clean. Now you are able to come into the presence of God. Okay? I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. You know, I shall be white in the snow. It's oftentimes, it's, it's, you know, that expression is used to clean somebody's garment. Okay? 
Imagine your garment is, is, is filthy, it's, it's, you know, there's, there's, you know, dirt, and, you know, in this case, you know, obviously, because there's this blood in his hand, you know, he, he murdered, and uh, he sinned before God. Okay? So, God, wash my clothes clean. You know? Who can wash our sin, right? Only, only the blood of Jesus. So here, once again, he is, the psalmist, which is David, is, is, is pointing to the, the work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary to make us white as snow. To, it's not just rubbing our, our, you know, our scrubbing. You, know, you may have the best kind of uh, detergent or stain remover. No, but it's saying almost it's, it's giving us this expression that he's giving us new clothes, new identity. You know, you can't scrub all you want. You can for you can put many hours to doing that, but it's saying, you know, God's gonna give you new clothes, new identity, a new. Uh, you know, it's going back to the legal term is that you are actually not guilty anymore. Therefore, God has given you a new uh, robe, a new clothes, new garment for you to wear. It says in uh, uh, Isaiah 1.18, Come now, let us settle the matter. Once again, it's a legal term, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be like white as snow. And though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. It's talking about you know, the ministry of Jesus Christ. Okay? And it goes on, verse 10. Uh, created in me a clean heart, O oh God, and uh, renew a right spirit within me. He's, he's calling to God, created me. It's like, God, you are the creator. You are the maker. Would you create in me a new heart? It's literally saying that. Would you make a new heart within me? Because my heart is, is tainted. It is no good. It is, it is messed up. It is sinful. God, I don't want this heart anymore. Yeah? And you know that that's what happens um, when you are saved. There's actually, God actually gives a new heart. He does not just, okay, I'm going to fix it up. He's a super glue. He's a, he's a whatever the glue that he's going to use. No, no, he gives us a new heart. So David here is like, create in me. God, you're a creator. You can't do anything. God, you know, create in me. Make me a new heart, oh God. It's literally saying that. And then renew a right spirit within me. Okay? Renew means you're being with something. It's almost used uh, this expression. Something was dead. Something was no good. But God is restoring. You know, and there's a newness of, of his spirit here. Oftentimes, the heart and spirit were interchangeable. Um, when you use the, um, when you see the expression heart and spirit, which means it's referring to the wholeness of oneself. It's everything, especially concerning the inner place of a person. And then it, the, the word goes on, take not your spirit from me. Okay. Or he says in, in my Bible, cast me not away your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. It's not saying, it's not referring to how, you know, in the New Testament because of, you know, Jesus, he went to his Father. He was ascended. Now he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. But because Jesus left, the Holy Spirit descended. Ascension need to have happen so that descension of the Holy Spirit could happen. So right now, all of us, we have the Holy Spirit in us. Amen? But that was not the case in the days of David. Because remember, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, the power of God fell upon Saul, but then it, it departed because of you know, Saul's disobedience. Okay? So here, it's not necessarily talking about the Holy Spirit present, but he's talking about anointing, His grace, His favor, uh, His presence. So he's saying, God, do not take your spirit away from me. Which means all, he's also talking about uh, that the relationship that God has, that intimacy that, that David had, a man after, on his, you know, after his own heart. So he's saying this, when, when we sin before God, not only you know, <laughs> we're guilty, right? You know, there are a lot of times, you know, God will convict our sin right away like this. Holy Spirit will reveal, and He's going to bring spirit of conviction. 
But, but so for a lot of us, including myself, it takes a long time for the Lord to reveal that, oh my gosh, I've done something wrong here. I need, I need to repent. So here, once again, here's, here's the heart of David. Lord, restore to me, verse 12, to the joy of salvation and uphold with me the willing, with me a willing spirit. And David knew what it meant to be right with the Lord. And he knew exactly what it meant to be not right with God. Not only his, his, uh, he was, he was in, he was guilty. Not only he's just ridden with all these emotions, he knew that he, he didn't have that kind of intimacy as he did with God. Remember the story of Adam and Eve. You know, God walked with them. God talked with them, conversed with them. But after they have sinned, what happened? Because of sin, their relationship was severed. No longer it was God and you know Adam walking together like this, but there is a distance because of we withdrew ourselves for God. And that's what sin does to, to us, right? Okay. So once again, uh, verse 12, I'm going to go back to restore me the joy of salvation, uphold me with the willing spirit. God, I want to be where you are. God, I miss you. God, help me. God, I, would you restore me that I'm in the right heart, right spirit? So you, you, you could sense the desperation from David, crying out, God, like, God, help me. Help me. In verse 16, I'm going to jump to verse 16 here. For you not delight in sacrifice, or I will give it. You will not be pleased with the burnt offering. The sacrifice of, of God, a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart of God, you will not despise. So here, David, as a king of Israel, he had everything, right? He could have offered thousand bulls to, to make up for his messed up. He could offer, he could just, you know, give every possession that he had, every wealth he had. But he knew that God would not accept that sacrifice. So he's just laying up before God. God, I'm broken. I'm utterly shame and guilt. I'm broken. I'm messed up, God. I'm giving myself to you, God. Because you're not, you know, you're not satisfied with what I have in a position of wise, but God, you want my heart, you want my desire. So you see right here, I am broken, I'm, I'm a contrite spirit, saying, God, I'm, I'm your, all yours. Okay. And I believe this is our heart, our true heart of repentance here. You know? It says, the sacrifice of a God, a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart of God, you will not despise. When the true repentance comes, God is not just talking about, oh God, you know what, I need to go back to church, I gotta do this, I gotta do my tithing and offering. But oftentimes, you know, it's this, you know, when we start from that, uh, from a place of nothing, from a place of humility, when we ask God, God, would you just take me as I am? Because I have no other way to, to, to come to you. And God allows brokenness in our lives, right? It's not to teach us a lesson. It's not to, you know, oh, okay, I'm going to punish you or, you know, but because of, you know, He desires the intimacy. He desires love. He desires there's nothing that will hinder our love with Him. And I think this is a good passage to, uh, um, uh, just to ref you know, reflect upon as we are going through the season of Lent, as you're getting closer to passion, uh, you know, uh, we, as you're remembering the suffering and uh, just this brokenness that Jesus had gone through, so that we can be made whole as well. Okay. All right, uh, moving on, Psalm 52. I might just to be able to cover um, just one more here, Psalm 52. And um, subtitle, mine says, The steadfast love of God endures. Once again, the psalm is talking about, you know, it is your love, it is your mercy, it is your loving kindness. And it goes on. Uh, verse 1 through, um, I think the, the few verses, it, it talks about the uh, drastic uh, comparison between the, the wicked, 
You know, he talks about why do you why do you boast of evil, O mighty man? The steadfast love of God endures uh, all day. You know, and talks about uh, the the evil, the wicked people versus the good people. He's making he's making a drastic con- contrast here to see this is why I'm God. Once again, this is I'm 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 on your side. I'm 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 in your team, O oh God. And verse eight. Um, this I think this is a quite interesting. Uh, and an important uh, verse here um, of the uh, Psalm 52 verse 8, but I'm like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the steadfast love of God forever and ever. When you look at this uh, um, uh, word olive tree, it often uh, represent the nation of Israel, by the way. Okay? Uh, by the way, olive tree can survive, I heard that it can survive anywhere. I have never owned an olive tree, uh, but uh, it's, it, it, it represents security, prosperity, and also blessing. Whenever there's an olive tree, um, it, just, you know, just, there's, it just multiplies. It, it just thrives at the uh, uh, harshest environment and thrives in desert and um, just places that you, know, you don't think that a tree will survive. And, um, but it says... Uh, in Psalm it says this in verse 8, but I'm like a green olive tree in the house of God, but because of your covenant, like, is, you know, we're referring to that, that, that the covenant of God that, that God had with the nation of Israel to bless His people, to be with His people, to never forsake His people. And another thing that olive tree presents is, is a, a symbol of peace, shalom, is talking about our relationship with, uh, you know, God, uh, with us, through that that the peace of God, right? Peace offering that Jesus offered on the cross of Calvary as well. Okay. Therefore, verse nine, I will thank Him. I will thank You forever because You have done it. I will wait for Your name, for it is good in the presence of the godly. It's actually talking about, we, we talked about it in a previous chapter, he talked about the city of God in the companionship of, with godly people, in the community of his believers, a community like an olive tree. I'm in, in your house of God. I'm secure, I'm confident because you are with me, because you have covenanted yourself with me. Okay? So that was the heart of David right here. Um, so I think we're going to stop right here so that Pastor Pitts can pick up with this Psalm of David, which is a very important psalm from Psalm 53 next week. Um, any questions, any comments here? Yeah, there's a lot, right? There's a lot. And once again, there's uh, so much of an you know, a emotional roller coaster. And yet, uh, the psalmist always goes back to God, like, God, you are my hope, you are my refuge, you are my strength, you are my, uh, you are my deliverer, you are you're everything, God, at the end of the day. So I think that's oftentimes, that's how our life looks like. Even the tribulations, even the hardships may come, at the end of the day, we just simply, humbly come before God, saying, God, thank you for your word, thank you for your promise. Uh, with that, let me just close us in prayer. Um, so thank you, God, for your word. Um, we, we're just so thankful for uh, your promise, God. Uh, God, just lift up, Lord, ourselves and uh, uh, perhaps uh, anyone in this place or even joining through a uh, um, live stream may be going through a time of difficulty, time of challenging times, and uh, just to almost like the going almost like journeying with these words of the psalmist when he was going through uh, just a season of loneliness and sorrow sadness and just you name it God but just over and over again and yet the psalmist said and yet I'll praise you and yet I'll hope in you and yet I'll lift my hands up and yet I'll trust in you so we just ask for that spirit of encouragement would you strengthen our hearts and desires for you, God? And we just we thank you, God, that you're the lifter of our heads, Lord. 
So we ask that would you strengthen us and would you protect us, God, and give us your grace, Lord, able to walk this journey because journey can be really difficult at times. And for those who are uh, going through a season of loneliness, God, and I just ask that would you send your people, would you send your godly people to to journey and to to know that, God, they're not in this alone, Lord, that would you send your company of your righteous people, uh, the, the one you can trust, Lord. God, we, we thank you for uh, tonight. We ask for your blessing. Uh, would you just bless our families represented here, Lord? And God, we just ask for more of you, Jesus. We thank you. Uh, we love you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining tonight. And, uh, um, you know, Pastor Pitts will uh, pick up from uh, chapter uh, 53. So please hold on to your sheets, uh, you know, if you can. So uh, we hope to see you again. God bless you.